One man. One hundred guests. One thousand drinks. Drinking with Jason. <laughs> Well, hello there, weirdos. Welcome back to Drinking with Jason, episode number 20. This week, I am slinging some crazy drinks with Richard Thomas, author of, by the looks of it, about 467,000 works. <laughs> what is going on, my man? <laughs> Not much. How are you doing? I'm doing all right now that I'm sitting here relaxing for the day. I don't even really consider this work. So Right. Nice. Nice. So Richard was sent to me by... Wow, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Joe. Crystal Lake? Yeah, yeah, Joe Crystal Lake. Right. Yeah. Two in a row. And as I was looking over your stuff, I was like, holy shit, man. You really do have a lot of stuff out there. How long have you been writing? Um, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll raise my toast to you real quickly. This is oh, in yeah. my, my Dracula mug. Uh, I was teaching in Transylvania. Was it last summer? God, it seems like two years ago. So that's a, a souvenir from Transylvania. Um, fitting. Uh, what am I up to? Is that, is that the question? Yeah. What's going on? What are you doing tonight? Oh man. So much is going on. It's been, uh, yeah, I've been writing about eight years. Uh, I came to this a little bit later in life. Uh, I've been in advertising for 20 years and kind of woke up one day and said, I'm not really happy being an art director and graphic designer. Something was kind of missing from my life. Hmm, this story <clears throat> sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> was me. And uh, it was one of those weird things that I, uh, I saw the movie Fight Club. And I remember coming out of that movie, and it just really kind of got to me. There were a couple movies that came out around that time. And I looked up Chuck Palahniuk, and I was like, oh, my God, there's a book. You know, this is based on a, a book by an author. And I went, basically went back and found all of his books and, and basically read everything he had out at the time. So I read, like, you know, Choke and Survivor and lullaby and diary and all this stuff. And that got me really excited to kind of read again. Um, I've always been a big reader and, and a writer, but I don't know, something about it just kind of woke me up a little bit. I started hanging out in his, at his website, chuckpolonic.net, and there are all these people there. We were just talking about Fight Club and Chuck and other stuff, and uh, that kind of got me to some other authors um, who were doing this thing. Uh, Chuck, I, is, I guess, is kind of a transgressive author. Um, people who are writing something called neo-noir, which is, it just means new black, um, contemporary dark fiction. And that got me to a couple people, uh, Craig Clevenger, Stephen Graham Jones, and Will Christopher Bear. And I, reading Chuck's stuff uh, and then reading their stuff, the neo-noir stuff I was reading was just really so cool. Uh, this really interesting mix of like horror and crime, kind of the sweet spot between there. I guess it was, it was kind of like if, you know, David Lynch wrote a book, you know, or David Fincher or Christopher Nolan, kind of this moody, dark, atmospheric stuff. Not traditional noir or film noir, but kind of the intersection between that atmosphere you get in noir and the tension and uh, violence of, of horror. So it's a really interesting place. And that got me excited to write. I ended up taking a class with Craig Clevenger and... Um, because I was just was a big fan of his stuff. He only has two books out, but he really impressed me. I thought, well, I want to study with one of these guys because this is what I want to do. I took his class, and it was my first class in, you know, in 20 years, so it was all so new to me. Um, but coming out of that class, I had one story that he said was really good, uh, the story called Stillness. He said, Richard, you really should send this out. I really think it's a good story, something special. And I, I had no faith in myself. I never sent out a story. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I had no faith in sending it out. I didn't want to do it. So I was like, well, okay. And so I sent it out to all the wrong places, you know, the New Yorker and Paris Review and all these places. I mean, first of all, I wasn't going to get it anyway, but um, not even the right kind of fiction for them. Um, and then I've, I've been a big fan of Cemetery Dance, the publisher, and so I wanted to get into the magazine. So I sent them the story, and they uh, actually took it, but not for um, – the magazine for an anthology called Shivers, Shivers Six. Mm -hmm. I think and I have Shivers Four up there on my yeah, shelf. Yeah, nice, nice. And even though I'm a, I'm a big fan of Cemetery Dance, I actually had never heard of the anthology, and so I was a little disappointed because I wanted to be in the magazine. Um, but I was like, hey, it's my first professional sale. Um, they're a great publisher. Of course, of course, I want to be in Shivers Six. 
And uh, Brian Freeman, who was putting it together, and Richard Chismar over there, Brian was like, yeah, it's okay. Trust me, this is going to be good. You're going to want to be in here. It's, it's going to be really great. So I'm waiting. You know, I've been shopping the story for like six months. Finally got in, waiting like another six months. Like a year later, they finally announced the table of contents. And I'm in there alongside Stephen King and Peter Straub and a bunch of other authors and just kind of, I think I probably started crying at my computer or something. Yeah, a couple of no-name losers in that book. <laughs> so that was kind of what got me writing again. It just kind of gave me the, the confidence to, to write more stories. Yep. When was this? Uh, 2009 or so. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah I've, only, so I've been writing about eight years. So that was kind of my first big professional sale. And then I took some more classes online, and then I decided to get my MFA, my Master's of Fine Art in Creative Writing. I did a, a low-res program down in uh, Murray, Kentucky at Murray State University. And so that was kind of me applying the, a serious commitment to it, you know, time and money, um, and coming out of that in 2012. Um, so that's kind of how I got really back into writing after many, many years. I used to write in, in high school and college, but I, I kind of put it aside to work in advertising and you know chuck got me back into it which is ironic because then many many moons later a couple of years ago i ended up um, editing an anthology with chuck paul and it called burnt tongues we were just talking about that um that came out and was a, a bram stoker nominee and uh, really opened the door for a lot of unknown authors kind of came out of this workshop that we had over at his website where i was a workshop moderator and helped nominate the stories um we ended up selling it to medallion <clears throat> which was a pretty exciting process because i kind of stepped in as editor and agent and helped shop it and put it all together and we ended up getting to a little bit of a bidding war with a couple of different presses and they offered us a nice advance and um kind of just turned out to be this really cool project a lot of these authors who were pretty unknown getting published for the first time chalk even invited a couple of them to go on tour with them so a couple people read it live events and um you know doing that kind of got me into doing other anthologies um, which led to me being the editor in chief at Dark House Press, where I've you know, now put out two anthologies: the uh, the New Black, which is what neo noir means, being the first one, and then our our most recent one, Exigencies. And then I did another anthology with Black Lawrence Press called The Lineup: Twenty Provocative Women Writers, which is all women, kind of edgy literary fiction. And then somehow, in in between all that stuff, I wrote a bunch of stories. <laughs> Whenever I wasn't working on a novel, I I, I published over a hundred short stories in the past eight years, and um, I signed a two book <laughs> I signed a two book deal with Random House Alibi for uh, the first book break uh, disintegration. I ended up writing the first half of my MFA program, and then finished it when I got out, um, and then just had the second book Breaker come out in January, but. Uh, that was kind of an interesting process going through my MFA because my, basically my thesis director said to me, I don't know if this book is thesis material. And I'd already written the first half. What it basically means is I don't think it's good enough. <laughs> so I had to put it aside for a year and a half and then came back to it later to finish it and then ended up landing an agent and then we shopped it and sold it to Random House. And um, I got a really great blurb from, from Irving Welsh who called it a, a stunning and vital piece of work and Chuck Wendig you know, called it a twisted masterpiece. And it's one of those things, you know, I'm sure as a, as a writer, um, all your listeners can relate to it, that you have these ups and downs, these highs and lows. One day, you know, you're king of the world, and the next day you just, I'm a hack, and what am I doing, and I should quit. So it's, I kind of cling to those moments when I'm doubting myself, and I, I go, well, Irving Welsh said it was pretty good. So okay. <laughs> then maybe right. it doesn't totally suck. All right. That, uh, <laughs> that was, congratulations, the longest I think what's going on, how long you've been writing answer <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. I think a quarter of the podcast is gone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get no, you. No, it's, it's cool. I'm just, I, I've been I should have warned so you too. It's, it's really everything kind of coming together at once. I mean, it's like some of these projects, you know, I, I pitched them like four years ago and then they came out last year. You know, it's like so many things we've been working on and working on and it, it's been three years of work and like it just came out like last year. So it's, Everything's kind of coming together at the same time, and it's just kind of nuts. So, sure. Well, you were saying how busy you were right before we started. All right, yeah. I'm going to try to work my way through some of that. Although I have the, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have the memory of a goldfish, so I'm going to forget sure, sure, 90% sure. of that. Okay, so you just you started writing 
a while ago, but yeah. you just really got back into it eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I basically, when I turned 40, I'm, I'm 48 now. And, um, so I started writing when I was 40 and I just realized that I enjoyed it. And I think, you know, placing a story here and there. And I, I sold my first book transubstantiate to a small press and actually went into my MFA having already sold a few stories. So I, I felt like, well, maybe I don't, you know, totally suck. Maybe I have a little bit of ability here and, um, getting my MFA kind of brought in that literary angle to what I was already doing in genre fiction. Um, you know, growing up, I'm a, a big fan of Stephen King and, you know, Ray Bradbury. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, just an inside joke. Every single episode, Stephen King has been mentioned. Gotta say it. Where, where's um, the chicken? You gotta have a chicken drop down. Right? I love, even if I have like a, a romance author on, <laughs> Stephen King comes up somehow. Yeah. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No. Um, well, you know, he's very prolific and I, I, he, he's really kind of an inspiration. Uh, his book on writing is really good. Part memoir, part craft book. And it's know, my favorite book about writing. I recommend yeah, it to everyone. Yeah. It's one I go back to a lot. Um, I think what I like about him a lot too, is that he's not just a horror writer. You know, he has some great, you know, I mean, I don't know what you call the dark tower series This weird kind of Western fantasy, horror, post-apocalyptic, I don't know, it's this really strange mix of stuff. Um, I just think he's a great storyteller, you know, and, and some of the, sh I love his short fiction too. I mean, The Stand is probably my favorite. It's one of those books that you just kind of, when you read it, it's just so intense and so big. Yeah, so The I, Stand I, or It are my favorite. Yeah, my favorite yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think, you know, having with that genre background growing up, you know, got me to college where I then, <clears throat> you know, read the beats and stuff and, and Ginsburg and Burroughs and, and Kesey and Kerouac. And um, then in my MFA program, I was drawn to kind of the the black sheep of the literary world, you know, Cormac McCarthy and Dennis Johnson and Mary Gates Gill, Joyce Carol Oates, Toni Morrison, Haruki Murakami, um, you know, anybody that was a little bit left or right of center, just a little bit off um, of what I was drawn to. And then that's kind of positioned me where I, when I came out of there in 2012, that to kind of write, I write across a number of different genres. So while some people kind of like King, you know, may think I'm a horror writer. I mean, I write fantasy, science fiction, I write crime, I write Southern Gothic, I write magical realism, you know, I write literary. It's just kind of whatever moves me at that, at that moment. Well, I see your website says you write neo-noir transgressive slipstream fiction, <laughs> which when I read that, <laughs> Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> well, read, what to say next? Read that next part. What to say? Yeah, I like that. It just means dark and strange. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, you know, genre and, and defining genres and, and subgenres, I think, is, is handy for when you're trying to, you know, find an audience or if you want to be in a certain anthology or you're submitting to a certain press. But, you know, I mean, I think it's kind of, in the end, it doesn't really matter, I guess, unless you're positioning a book on a bookshelf or something. And even then, they usually just put it all in fiction. Um, you know, I just tend to write the story that I want to write and worry about what, what it's really going to be later. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like I was, I, a year or two ago, I started, I realized that a lot of my stuff had death in it. Um, and I tried to replace the center of my stories um, instead of having death, having love, which is for a dark fiction writer is very interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. because people still die. <clears throat> it's just a little bit more gothic, I guess. Um, I, I tell this story that I, uh, <clears throat> when I was hanging out with Chuck Palahniuk and Irving Wells this summer, uh, Chuck came out on tour and it was my first chance to really hang out with him one-on-one -on -one since the anthology. I mean, I've gone to see him read several times and he's, he's a great reader, a great performer. It's quite a spectacle, but I never really got to hang out like one-on-one -on -one privately. And so I got to hang out with Chuck and Irving, uh, after the, the reading. <clears throat> and I, I told Irving the story, um, that I, my wife always says I should write something more romantic or funny, right? And so I said, oh, I'll write you this romantic kind of love story. <clears throat> Trying to write this new magical realism that was less violent and less dark. And so it ended up being the story called Flowers for Jessica, which is published in uh, Weird Fiction Review. And it's about a guy, a husband and wife, and their son dies. So right off the bat, uh, obviously very a light romantic story. Um, and the wife basically goes to the edge of the forest, lies down, and dies of a broken heart. Okay, so I know. More romance, more lightness, more fun and humor. <clears throat> so he, the husband goes to, I'm, I'm telling the story to Irving Welsh as we're waiting for Chuck to start his reading. 
because I had never met him before, and I'm like, I, I want to see if I can make him laugh, tell him a story, because I don't, you know, I don't know him. He's there with his girlfriend. I had some friends there from uh, the cult and stuff, and um, I thought it'd be a funny story to tell because it's pretty embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this guy goes to this edge of the forest where um, his his wife has died because he doesn't know where else to go. He's alone now, right? So he goes to the edge of the forest, and there's like an indentation in the grass where she had died. Like it's still there, an impression in the in the in the earth. And so he he kneels down and he's kind of touching it and kind of crying and sobbing, and then you know just kind of sweating. The sun's beating down on him. He's sweating and like he gets up and leaves. Comes back the next day. And now something's growing in the space where that indentation used to be. Just some vines slowly starting to creep up, and he realizes something weird's going on. So he starts to water it, and then comes back the next day and starts to form in more of her body. Just kind of the vines like veins. Um, so he waters it some more, and so now you've got like um, this red bloom where her heart should be, and like these little white buds where her nipples would be, and kind of this kind of pink bloom where her brain would be, and, and these little green like buds, um, kind of iridescent where her eyes used to be, and she's cu- she's coming back to life. And so he doesn't know what to do, and so he thinks, well, I need to get some minerals into her. So he ends up like urinating on her to try and give her the minerals that his body <laughs> can't process, right? <laughs> so he's, and she starts to come back more and more. So now her skin's like translucent, and she's not quite fully formed, lying there naked, right, <clears throat> kind of writhing in the in the in the the shade, and the trees are kind of blowing back and forth. And like he's kind of communicating with her, and he's like, "No, I can't do this. I can't, I can't bring you all the way back. I can't just, you know, I can't create lust out of want. You know, I can't just do this." And she's like, and then he looks down, and he realizes that he loves her, and he misses her, and he does kind of desire her. And the way to bring her all the way back, yeah, I'm going to go here, is he has to kind of jerk off, and his seed will bring her all the way back to flesh, right? So he leaves after that act, goes home, can't come back for a couple of days. He's drinking heavily. I mean, he's already a mess, as it is. And he doesn't want to come back. because He doesn't know what he, he's, like, afraid of what he's doing. He's like, what have I done? This abomination. What am I messing with here? He, cu- he comes back finally, and she's fully formed. She's come back to life. She's lying there waiting for him, and he's just grief-stricken. But he's he's in love, and he's happy she's back. And so he kneels down, and she wraps her arms around him, and she pulls him into the earth. And then that's the end of the story. Oh, so so, okay. I, so I, I, give, I give this short story to my wife, saying, here's this romantic you know, story I wrote for you, honey. And she reads the story. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, I'm really excited because I think this is beautiful, right? <laughs> in my twisted mind. And I come back in the room and she's like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> like, <laughs> like throws a story at me. It's like, I can't, don't give me any more of stories. And, yeah. So that's, that's a, awesome. Yeah. So even when I try to do something more romantic or sweet, or funny, it still turns out to be something dark and strange. And yeah. <laughs> that's it's a pretty interesting story, there, man. Yeah. It's uh... <laughs> it, it is what it is, I guess. Right? <laughs> that's your love story. I mean, we I are, we some... are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted that. So you you got an MFA. Yes, I, sir. How do you feel that helps you with your writing? Because I'm not going to lie, most of the people I know who went to school for creative writing aren't very good at creative writing. Like, um, they more have more of a literary bent, even, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, uh, yeah. their storytelling doesn't always seem on point. So hearing that you have successfully done it and have had so many stories comes out is really interesting. Thanks. Um, it's very tricky. I think, I think part of what helped me was I went in with a, a pretty strong point of view. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of academia really does not support genre fiction, but... The stories I sent in were what the, the stories that I write. You know, one of them was Stillness, the one that got into Cemetery or Cemetery Dances, uh, Shiver Six. It's about a guy at the end of the world who's pushing a button to protect this kind of gate and this land. He's the end of the world kind of thing. And then at the end of it, there's kind of this weird shift where it's not what you think it is. <clears throat> but it definitely was not um, literary. <laughs> um, I didn't send him that other story, though, Flowers for Jessica. <laughs> I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't written that one yet, so I've evolved into that one. Um, but I went, I went in, and you know, it was a really interesting development, because I wrote the first half of the novel with my first, pro- my first professor, Lynn Pruitt, who didn't really know what neo-noir was. 
maybe maybe Dennis Lehane might be the biggest name. Um, and so I said, well, hey, here's this book by Will Christopher Bear, Kiss Me, Judas. Here's uh, Clevenger's uh, Contortionist Handbook. Here's Stephen Graham Jones. Here's Dennis Lehane. Check it out, read it, and then you'll understand where I'm coming from. And so she did, and she said, okay, I get you. I get you. Let's, let's go for it. And she was very supportive. And then when I went to my other professor, who had been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> He, and, he, and he tells me the book is in thesis material. You know, I kind of had a crisis of, you know, identity. I wasn't sure what I, I thought I knew what I was doing, and he kind of shattered that. <clears throat> so I kind of thought to myself, well, what do I do? Do I quit? <laughs> I went back to the other professor, you know, practically in tears, and I was like, well, I don't know what to do, and can I switch out? And, uh, you know, I, I'm shocked, and I had so much he, My professor, my other professor, his name's Dale Ray Phillips. He's a, a brilliant professor brilliant teacher and writer. The first day of class, they, they were reading the opening to my book, Disintegration. And he asks people, okay, at the end of the first page, raise your hand if you would continue reading. And nobody raised their hand. And these are my friends, people I've like <laughs> hung out with and had drinks with, and nobody wanted to keep reading. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I would keep reading. This is a good opening. And, at that, and that's why I was like, holy crap, what am I, maybe I don't really have a clue. So what I ended up doing was I put that book aside and I worked on literary short fiction with him. And what it really taught me was when you study the literary masters of the short story, whether it's you know Carver or Cheever or, or Joyce Carol Oates or whoever you want to study. Um, you know, I read through all these, the best American anthologies. I read through uh, all these, these Bibles of short stories. And, and a lot of it I didn't like, but <clears throat> the stuff that I did like, um, I figured out why it worked, and that really helped me as far as structure. It helped me as far as you know emotion and character. Um, he made me write short stories for him, and he gave me a couple rules. He said, "In your story, and he, you got you got to understand this guy. He, he smokes. I, I call him like an old codger. He's kind of <laughs> talks. He's like Richard. Kind of talks like that. Richard. What he used to say to me is, uh, Richard, save. Uh, he'd say, save the." Save the slow reveal for the strippers. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's would, a great line. Yeah, he would he would look at the uh, he look outside and he'd see a squirrel. It's like that dog in the movie Up. He'd be like, "Squirrel, God damn, I hate squirrels." You know, and he was so funny. Um, but I learned from him, and so I read all these people he told me to read. You know, people I probably never would have read Toni Morrison. Um, you know, I hadn't read Haruki Murakami. Um, uh, you know, other people I, I got to, it just really, really kind of, you know, got me to read people I never would have before. Um, I forget who, there's a story called The Swimmer. I can't remember if that's Cheever. I think that's Cheever. Um, it's such a weird little surreal story. Um, but it has such great atmosphere, but it's very literary. Um, there's, but there's a lot of people that are doing really cool things. So I think coming out of the MFA program, I, I kind of was the best of both worlds because I'd already read extensively genre fiction. You know, I'd read a lot of Stephen King. I read a lot of, you know, Dean Koontz and Peter Straub and John Grisham, a lot of popular writers. Um, and so I kind of already had that point of view, but getting that literary influence really kind of helped me to elevate my language and to kind of write these stories on, and these novels on two different levels. Um, on the surface, you could read it, and it's entertaining, and you can turn the pages, and things are happening on the page. But there's also this underlying um, symbolic uh, meaning and metaphor and philosophy. So it can be deeper if you want it to be deeper. If you don't want it to be deeper, you don't have to dig down deeper. You can just let it be. So I think in the end, it benefited me, but it definitely wasn't, I think, the plan <laughs> going in uh, to, to have that kind of that weird intersection where I thought that maybe I, I just didn't know what I was doing. Okay. That's inter yeah. that's no, that's really interesting. And before all the people taking creative writing majors, uh, shit on me, <laughs> uh, I was referring more to genre fiction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, <clears throat> and I mean, just in the one creative writing course I had in college, it was like genre fiction sucks was right. kind of the mantra. Right. And I'm like, what? That's all I like to read, you know, kiss my ass. Um, right. So of course those people aren't going to be great at writing genre fiction because they don't even respect it. So. Right, and I, and I think that's a big mistake because I think I think you have to come at it from both directions. I think that's the smartest thing to do as a writer. I mean, if you look at what's on the New York Times bestseller list, 
it's not literary fiction for the most part. It's, it's mystery and crime and romance and horror and fantasy and science fiction and some literary fiction. Um, it's tough to be a writer. It's tough to be a literary writer. I mean, so few people can make a living at it. To turn your back on genre fiction, to not educate your students on what actually sells, I think is, is borderline irresponsible. And I, and I, I, had to, I 100% agree. I 100% agree. I, Anytime had, somebody yeah. asks me about how mm -hmm. to get into writing and stuff, I'll often tell them, if you're taking a creative writing course, take what they're telling you to sell and submit with a grain of salt. Not always. I mean, I'm sure there are some really great professors. I th hell, I think Stephen King taught yeah. writing before, but <clears throat> some of these people don't like the genres you like, so be careful. Yeah, and I, you know, there are more programs are changing. I think Seton Hill has a popular genre writing MFA program now. I was just out at University of California Riverside a couple months ago, and they and they are Todd Goldberg runs that program. It's a great program. Um, one of my friends, kind of an informal mentor, uh, Stephen Graham Jones, teaches out there, and um, they really support genre fiction, um, but nice. also also teach literary fiction too. And I think that's that's cool. I think more and more programs understand that it's important, and you can't just turn your back on it. Um, because I mean, if you want to come out of an MFA program and write stuff that sells, you have to think about what people are buying. So I mean, obviously, you have to be yourself. You know, your voice is your voice. I don't write like Stephen King. I don't write like Chuck Palahniuk. I don't write like Ray Bradbury. I don't write like Cormac McCarthy. But I probably picked up a little bit from each of them along the way, different things, whether it's dialogue or tension or world building or setting or whatever. Um, and then I just eventually become Richard Thomas. You know, I eventually have my voice so that when you go to read a Richard Thomas story, you, you know what you're getting yourself into. And even then, within the range of my own work, it can be darker or lighter or more literary or leading towards a certain genre. I mean, I do write science fiction. I do write fantasy. Um, I've even written a Western or two. So, I mean, it really just kind of depends on, um, I think, it's, it's, as with, it is with anything, when you're an artist, I think whatever you create, you have to really have a vision and an, and an, an aesthetic. And it's important to stick to that and kind of hone it and improve it and evolve and then put that out into the world and be who you're going to be. You know? No, I, com I completely agree. The, the, <clears throat> there's like a, I guess there's a crossroads between your style, what you want to write and what sells. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're just trying to find that little spot where everything crosses mm -hmm. over. I mean, and that's just assuming you want to make a living as a writer. If right. You just right. want to write whatever crazy shit you want to write and you don't care if it sells, <laughs> you know, do your thing. Right. But, uh, yeah. It's, it's a very small subsection. And I often feel like, you know, you get these people who hate literary fiction and just with complete disdain and yeah. they're only trying to write what sells and they're writing to market. And then you get these literary fiction guys who view that as completely crazy. Right. And I, I, I feel like sometimes they don't talk enough. And if they did, right. your writing would be better and maybe you'd tell something. I, I couldn't agree more. I, 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 yeah, I agree with that 100%. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, writing my two book series at Random House Alibi, working with my editor, Dana Isaacson over there. The first book I had with them, Disintegration, I, you know, I finished it, it sold. Um, my style tends to be whatever the opposite of minimalism is, so maximalism, but I, I like heavy setting. I like it to be lyrical and dark and heavy, but to also move, but I, I like a lot of setting in my stuff. Um, I'm, I'm no Cormac McCarthy and I'm no Ray Bradbury, but you know, I definitely am inspired by them, what they do. Um, writing the second book for that, um, Windy City Dark Mystery series, I purposely, uh, based upon their advice, made it less purple, as some people called my my voice, um, but less you know less weird, less uh, heavy on all the uh, sensory items, um, and made it a little more straightforward, on purpose, because we wanted it to be a little bit more commercial. Now it's still me, it's still my voice, it's still my book, um, I. In, in my head, in my, when I envision it, and I always picture it like in film terms when I look at my books, it's still the same atmosphere. <clears throat> it's maybe just dialed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and what's funny is that I was very worried after I spent like six years on disintegration between writing it in school, putting it aside, <clears throat> shopping it to like 40 small presses, not finding a sale, shopping it another year to 100 agents where I found my agent, 
shopping it for another year until I sold it to Random House. All that time, I was then very worried that with the second book, Breaker, that I wasn't, you know, the sophomore slump, even though it's my third book, but my second big book, um, I didn't know if I could do better than Disintegration. And I wanted it to just be as good, you know? And what, what's funny is that I've had several people tell me they liked it more. And I was like, huh. I was like, really? I'm like, I, I went into it, I felt pretty good about it, but I'm like, well, this is like, you know, Richard Light or whatever. <laughs> you know, styled back a little bit. But, you know, I found more people who really um, weren't distracted by the pros and it was a little more straightforward. So it's interesting. You kind of talk about pushing it towards the middle a little bit and not, not necessarily aiming for the, the lowest common denominator, but just kind of having the most, the broadest appeal, uh, making it the most marketable. Um, and so, you know, based upon that, I mean, I, I did some things in the first book. We cut out a rape scene that became a near rape scene that became something entirely different um, based upon those same kind of considerations. That instead of this being my protagonist hitting bottom, it was his first step up into the light so that when we got to the ending, which we changed for like the sixth time, um, it made more sense. And that the whole trip, the whole journey, the whole arc, I'm trying to get this in the shot, the whole arc <laughs> um, <laughs> isn't, you know, down, 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 down. You know, it's not Requiem for a Dream. It, it starts to come up a little bit at the end so that when it ends on an up note with a, a little bit of hope, it doesn't feel out of place, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you said the first book you signed with them was the one your professor basically told you wasn't any good yeah. <laughs> yeah isn't that just a great example of what we were talking about <laughs> yeah yeah well I, and it's one of those funny things that coming out of my mfa program i thought my teacher really disliked me i mean i thought he tolerated me and maybe had a little bit of respect for what i was doing but i, I never thought he liked me when it, when he did um be my thesis director and i ended up staying with him as, as my professor the rest of the time because he was just so brilliant um when he introduced me to do my final reading, um, he said the nicest stuff about me. You know, he said, if anybody's going to make it out of this program and make a living at it, it's, it's this guy. You know, he's publishing alongside these people. And he just, like, had this whole big introduction. And I was, like, practically in tears. You're, you're recognizing a theme here. I'm a big baby. Um, but I just... The writes I was, about kissing on dead wives. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I just was shocked because I, I really didn't think he liked me at all. And he had such nice things to say that when I got went up to read, I was a little, you know, choked up because I just didn't. So I think even when you're kind of fighting someone for every sentence and paragraph and you may not agree, maybe the stuff I write isn't what he's initially drawn to. You know, he would, um, when I would get a compliment from him, cir circling a sentence or marking something, you know, a, a line. When he gave me a compliment, which was rare, it, it meant a lot. You know, if he called a line brilliant or said this is just, great atmosphere or this 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 is a great hook um like i was just like hungry for the hungry for those compliments they meant a lot so that's yeah, really think, great that you got so much out of the program though that's yeah i i think but like kind of like what you said i had to kind of fight for it and i had to you know really believe in what i was doing and if i if i didn't have as much confidence i could see a, a, a person with less voice or less you know commitment to what they're doing coming out of the program more you know, homogenized, more watering everything down to kind of fit the middle and then writing more literary fiction that maybe doesn't have as much heart or as much, you know, tension. It's not quite as visceral. So I think it's tough, but I think you got to fight for it, you know, no matter what you do, right? No, I totally agree. And I'm also a big believer that anytime somebody tells you something can't sell, I don't think they know what the hell they're talking about because it really seems like nobody can predict what the hell is going to be a hit. Like, had you told me Fifty Shades of Grey was going to be, <laughs> God. I'd have pointed you to the billion erotica books on Amazon. You know, I've been like, eh, no. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think anybody knows. I no. just, it's crazy. So, you know, I, it's a weird, it's a, it's such a bizarre business, man. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's definitely some stuff that's poorly written. I mean, I, I am also an editor. I edit people privately and, of course, running Dark House Press and then uh, other other projects like, like the Gamut Kickstarter I have going right now. Um there are definitely some some stories I get, some books I get that are just really bad. And like Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> the writing. In that. I you know I I have read some some excerpts from that, and people pointed out some of the lines, and I'm like, wow, that's that's bad. I I mean I, God, I, I it's it's like you said, it's so weird because I think if I wanted to edit that book, I would have been like, no, I can't do this. This is 
this is not erotic. This is right. not even good Yeah, you shit all over it, and then you would have killed like a multi-billion dollar. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. I, I, there must have, it's one of those, you know, zeitgeist moments that there was a need. Somebody somewhere needed to have some erotica they could hold in their hand and not be ashamed of it or read in their book. I don't know what happened that made that successful. Yeah. but it's, it's just a prime example of yeah. it just connected with people. But I, if I read that, if somebody gave that to me and said, hey, can you give me some notes on this? I'd have been like, are you for real? Like, <laughs> you know, but, you know, that yeah. just shows you what the fuck do I know? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was sitting here looking over your catalog and how many novels do you actually have? It looks like you've got a shitload of short stories. Um, I have three books. My first book is Trans Transubstantiate, which is kind of this weird seven person first person perspective uh, kind of lost meets the, the, the Truman show that was with a small press a number of years ago. <clears throat> and then I have uh, disintegration, disintegration and breaker. And then I have three short story collections. My first was called uh, herniated roots. The second was uh, staring into the abyss. And then my new one tribulations coming out with uh, <clears throat> crystal Lake in March is my third. So six books, and then I'm part of this novel and novellas uh, at the Zank Books. It's four novellas set in, it's four authors, four novellas in four different parts of a city over four seasons. Kind of this Sin City kind of vibe. Um, so that's probably up there too. And then I've edited a number of, I've edited four anthologies <clears throat> to it, uh, Dark House Press, The New Black and Exigencies, Burnt Tongues that I edited with Chuck Palahniuk and Dennis Widmeyer. And then the lineup. That's such a cool title. Yeah, thanks. Um, the lineup, 20 provocative women writers at Black Lawrence Press. So, and then, of course, I'm the editor-in-chief of Dark House Press, but I don't think I'm really tagged on those. And then I, I, what's cool is that you know, up on Amazon, I think I had some 50 different titles I'm tagged on. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those are journals or anthologies where I have a story in them. So, Jesus Christ, you're making me feel lazy here. So are you <laughs> a full-time author or do you also have another job? You know, man, I'm I'm trying. I'm trying, Jason. I'm trying to be a writer. It's it's tough. Um, right now, as we speak, I am trying to make a living as a full time writer. Um, I do still freelance as an art director and graphic designer, or I did last year. So far this year, this year I've not. This year, I've just been editing privately for clients. Um, I've been teaching online at Lit Reactor, where I teach a short story mechanics class. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm trying to do this whole gamut Kickstarter. Uh, I taught at Iowa last summer, University of Iowa, which is a great writing program. And then I actually went to Transylvania where I taught a, a horror workshop in the shadow of Bram Stoker's castle, which was a very cool experience. Um, and that then I did cool. some, yeah, and then I did some local stuff. I went up to Wisconsin for a couple <clears throat> conferences and workshops, went down to Oklahoma City for the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Writers Federation, and then uh, some sort of another conference in Texas. And so I've been trying to get out there and do more things. Um, Obviously, I would prefer to just write and sell a million books, <laughs> but since that hasn't quite happened yet, uh, you know, I have to kind of figure out a couple of different revenue streams. But I'm trying. I'm trying. Hey, I, I understand. I I just always like to ask because what I found is most people think writers make <clears throat> shitloads of money. So I always like to ask if the people I have on are full time, and <clears throat> I would say ninety percent I've had on here are not. Yeah, it's it's very tough to make a living as a writer. You have to sell a lot of books. You have to get a really big following. Um, you know, I I was just talking to Chuck Wendig. Um, he wrote an introduction to Exigencies, and you know, he's got some I don't know fifty, sixty thousand followers on Twitter or something. Um, you know, Irby Welsh has like five hundred thousand followers. You know, Polonic um, I don't know eight hundred or million or something. Um, but those you know they move a lot of books. I mean, Chuck's first book. I think having the movie out. Fight Club really helped him to get discovered. Um, probably the same thing with Irving and Train Spotting. Um, Chuck Wendig has a whole series. You know, he has a whole bunch of different books. He, I mean, I think that's where a lot of writers do well is they, if they can latch on to some sort of an identity. <clears throat> I mean, young adults fiction is just really booming. My, I have kids who are twelve uh, twins, a boy and a girl, and there's uh, they want these young adult series because when they get into a book, they want to read like six of them. <laughs> so a lot of people are figuring that out. Um, Series is what makes me oh, the vast yeah. majority of my money. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'd I'd be able to to be a full time author without writing in a series. It definitely it's helps. Big difference. Yeah, it does. 
I mean, now if you start if you write three books in a series and it doesn't sell, you know, you're up shit creek. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just wasted right. a lot of time. But uh yeah, it's made a big difference for me. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Particularly if you can if you can get like two series going that'll do well. Then yeah, then I that's when things really took off for me when I wrote a second series. But nice. Uh, nice. Um so I did want to ask too, it's another question I try to ask everyone. Are you is all your stuff out through like traditional publishers, small press, big publishers? Are you a hybrid author? You know, do you self-publish? What do you? Um, it's a mixture of stuff. I I've never really self-published anything, aside from like a, a short story here or there. You know, a, a Kindle single or something. Um, <clears throat> I worked a lot with a lot of small presses, a lot of independent press. Medallion is independent, but they're not small. They're actually pretty big, but they're definitely their own press. Um, while I'm with Random House, I'm with Alibi, their, their imprint. So I'm with a small imprint at a big house, um, which is cool because they, a lot of resources that I normally wouldn't have. I mean, I had so many people working on that on both books to, to get them right. The editing, the big picture edits, the, the, I mean, I mean, I had a page of just, you know, my style, you know, here's what you tend to say. So here's what we're going to honor and like whatever colloquialisms or any, any, uh, quirks to your what you say we're going to honor that i mean i had pages of characters i had a whole page of just dangling modifiers i mean to have a team of like six people editing your book makes you feel really good about putting it out in the world that it's pretty tight and there are a lot of you know stupid mistakes in it and then i have a, a marketing team there too pr and marketing which helps a lot now but, what does it mean to be with a smaller imprint in the bigger house what does that mean versus just being with like the main well the, the big thing with alibi is that we're ebook only so i'm not in print which is, you know, a little bit of a bummer, but uh, the book has still really gotten out there and has done well and it's gotten a lot of attention and been up for some awards and stuff. And, um, you know, they're very, Random House is still Random House, so, you know, they're helping to try and sell foreign rights and, um, you know, trying to sell film rights with my agent. So, I mean, they're, they're a really great company to be with, but, you know, I'm not at Random House proper, so I'm not, I'm not one of their big list authors. <laughs> I mean, I'm, sure. not even, I'm not even mid-list. <clears throat> but um, I, I like working with a lot of smaller. I mean, Dezank is pretty big in the indie community. They're, they're very literary. Um, you know, Crystal Lake is is, is smaller and, and very independent, a smaller independent press. But um, some of the best experiences I've had have been with presses like that because they really put a lot into it, even if they're just like one guy. <laughs> I mean, Staring into the Abyss was a Kraken press. And I, I think George is in like Sweden or someplace. And Joe at Crystal Lake is in like, I think South Africa or somewhere. Um, <laughs> so well, that, crazy. that was something else I wanted to ask you. So how do you get hooked up with say Crystal Lake? Um, Crystal Lake, I think I sent them a short story for an anthology and I got into one of their anthologies. I think it might've been fear the reaper and just started talking and then was in another anthology with them. And then, um, I think at some point I, I had this short story collection, and so I started shopping it around. And then um, I sold it to Cemetery Dance, who was pretty big in the independent horror community, but they only wanted the ebook part. This is all top secret, so don't tell anybody. They don't. Okay. It's not, it's not public knowledge yet. My lips are sealed. <clears throat> um, but then I had to find somebody for the print, and so I, I said, well, I, Joe likes my work. I was, give, had a couple stories with him. So it's just a matter of reaching out to a, an editor. I respected and a press that I really liked and they just done some pretty big things. And I was like, they're really working hard. So I'm like, I would like to work with them. And so I reached out and said, Hey, would you be interested in doing the print component to complement cemetery dances ebook side? And I think he'd already done that with another author. Um, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So, I mean, that's, that just kind of happened like that. But um, a lot of these presses, it's either, um, you know, at one time I was sending out a lot of short stories. I mean, I, I remember I had, 10, when I came out of my MFA program, I had 10 different short stories that I was submitting using a duotrope.com so I can keep track of it all because um, they were all different. I had, I had like five stories from my MFA program, one of which was kind of neo-noir. The rest were pretty straight lit. I had like a horror story. I had a fantasy story. I had like this weird Western story. And so I had each of them out to like 10 different markets and I'm like cross-referencing them and which ones can go here, which one can go there. And, I had over a hundred submissions out at one point, um, which was crazy. But I just, I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, ten stories. Yeah. Um, 
that's what happens when you start writing when you're 40. You, know? <laughs> you kind of have this built-in clock that's ticking, kind of panic mode. And but I'd, I'd had those stories with my MFA program. I've been I've been wanting to send them out, and so I had to wait until I was really done with them. And so I started sending them out. And literary magazines are the worst. I mean, they're so for being slow. Um, so I mean, I and and for not letting you submit to the same market at the same time. Um, although I I used to ignore that now and then. <clears throat> I don't do it as much anymore with a lot of the horror magazines because I'm getting closer, and I don't want to ruin a relationship with an editor I respect by pulling a story, you know, when they might actually be considering it. So I do, I do tend to honor that more now. Um, but with the literary, I mean, you have, I don't know, 50 professional paying markets. And so I would, I would rotate the stories. I had the alpha, I had like five stories divided in the alphabet, like to 10 letters of the alphabet. And I would rotate through. So as I, each story <clears throat> was going out, you know, it's a barrel house, and then it gets rejected from barrel house, and they go, okay, now it's going to black static or whatever, and I would kind of just work it through, and then it was a crazy system, but, you know, like I said, I was just kind of feeling like I was old and running out of time. So That's a lot, lot of work, stuff. man. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It's a lot of work. It's crazy. It's it's nuts, but... Um, and then Do last you spend year, more time doing that or more time writing? I think at that point, I had a lot of work. And so I was, I was really eager to get it out there into the world. Um, Duotrope is great. I'm, I pay 50 bucks a year to use it, and it's, it's an invaluable service to me because I can do research and I can see you know, what kind of stories are going where and where have I had. What is this? Duotrope, D-U-O-T-R-O-P-E.com. Um, <clears throat> it's a service, and you can, I mean, you can research by genre. You can research by pay rate. You can research by length of story, all this stuff. So I have a list of, like, my... Now it's probably like 400 favorite markets out there in the world. And I can divide it and say, hey, I want to look at just the literary markets. And I'll whittle it down to like 200. And I go, okay, I want literary markets, short story under 5,000 words that pays five cents a word or higher, pro rates. Uh, now it's down to like 40. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you can look at those and go, okay, which ones is a good fit? Have they been there before? And then they'll even say on there, like kind of like on Amazon, people who've submitted here have also submitted here. People who have published here have also published here. And so you get a lot of good ideas of where to send your work. And it also you keep track of it. It tells you how long they usually reject, you know, at what time period, 30, 60, 90, 180 days. So you can track it all. And then if it's overdue, you can drop them a note and say, hey, it's been with you for six months. And just wanted to make sure you're still considering it. And, you know, I, I find it invaluable. It's, it's just a, a great resource. And, um, you know, it has links to all the websites. You can go, oh, look, uh, you know, Shock Totem. I'll go to the website. Oh, here's Shock Totem. Here's our guidelines. Okay, cool. I've sent them four stories, four stories before. They rejected me. One of them was a personal rejection. Okay, so maybe I'm getting closer. <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. So That's a pretty cool service. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's really cool. I mean, I only wrote like four short stories last year. <laughs> so I didn't do a whole lot. And two of them were kind of um, on commission for anthologies anyway. So I think oh, I think I really only shopped two, so I didn't do it as much. But you know, I still go on there and send stuff out and look for places. So. Okay. Yeah, that, all right, that's really interesting. Uh, what was the name of the book you had with Crystal Lake? It's called Tribulations. Tribulations. Okay. Yeah. You've got so much freaking work here, and you've <laughs> said so many titles. I'm like, who, where? Yeah. yeah, that one's not even I don't think on Amazon yet because it's still kind of working with Cemetery Dance, trying to get the thing together. They don't like to announce until they have a book ready. They're a little different. They're like, announcement, buy it, <laughs> which kind of makes sense, actually. You know? Yeah, they, they also have a reputation for hmm. uh, being a little behind on their work. I think they take yeah. on a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, they've been mentioned five or six times on this, too, and I always tell everyone they actually are just a couple of miles up from my house. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I've wanted to get guys? in there to do a tour, but I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. What did you say? You ever, you ever met those guys? No? Uh, I have not. <laughs> no. Um, I talked to them on Twitter just a little bit, but uh, yeah. no, I haven't been up there yet. I'd really like to, though. It's actually, I think it's like a quarter of a mile from where my wife works. Yeah. So it's like right well, there. I got to let the dog. I think I can reach the door. <laughs> I don't want to yank my computer off. Okay, go. Go. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. She I'm surprised good. mine haven't started yet. But. <laughs> she was doing good for a way. She, she was just sitting here. I think because I'm talking so much, she's like, what are you doing? I want to come hang out with you. Are you talking to me? 
Are you talking to me? Uh, no. <laughs> so okay, so you've got tribulations coming out with Crystal Lake. Yes. And you told me before you have something else coming out very soon. Is that right? Um, Breaker just Breaker came just came out. out. Yeah. Then tribulations is next. And what's cool about tribulations, real quick, is that it just it's it's like my latest work. And I think as a short story writer, you want to feel like you're constantly evolving. So, I mean, all these stories, you know, except for maybe one, we'll see, are, have been published before, but within the last couple of years. So, you know, I look back to my first collection, and I'm like, oh, this is so bad. <laughs> I, I don't like any of these stories. I look back at my, my second collection, and I'm like, oh, there's a couple in here I like, but for the most part, not very good. You know, I, I don't like them anymore. This collection I'm really excited about because I think it's got some of my best work in it. Um, not all of my recent stuff, because I, like I said, I have two stories coming out this year, but I feel like as I keep honing my craft and taking classes and studying and working on it, that I, you know, the stuff I wrote that's coming out this year, I think is the best stuff I've ever written. So I, I'm excited to get that out, you know, with Cemetery Dancing with Crystal Lake, because I think there's some, I think there's some really good stuff in there, and I'm proud of it, and, you know, some of them have placed pretty well. I finally did get into Cemetery Dance Magazine, last year, issue number, I think 72 or 73. I have to look at it. I got a copy here. I always forget which one it was. 72 or 73. Here, can I, can I hold it up? Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Very nice. Congratulations. And did you happen to notice this little this joker up here? Can you read that? I don't know. Yeah. Stephen King? Oh, yeah. And I got a, a ch chicken pass to fall down. Um, yeah, his name keeps coming up. I'll have to read something <laughs> of his sometime. Yeah, we've heard that guy before. So I just, I just got lucky that I've been trying to get in the magazine for years. They opened the door for like a month. December, must have been December, two years ago. <clears throat> had like 800 submissions. And I had this story that I wrote in my MFA program. The one kind of weird story, kind of neo-noir. And I'd been shopping it for like eight months. And I've gotten so close at so many places. Really good places. I mean, shortlisted and like, ah. Uh, personal rejections from these editors and it was like man i was so close and then i sent it to them they closed their window they took like six stories i think out of like 800 and they took that story it was such a weird thing because i got the email and like i've been getting so many rejections that i i i always read the first line is thank you for submitting but <laughs> right. we're gonna pass and it said it said like the same language it was like thank you for submitting and we'd like to take your story. And I, the first time I read it, I was like, I thought it said, but we're going to pass. You know, I just like, I hallucinated <laughs> the rejection. I'm like, wait, wait, hold on. Wait, thank you for submitting. And we'd like to accept it. I'm like, all right. Wow. It was like, it was just so low key. It was just like, you know, wow. And you're in. So, I mean, that was like a, a white whale for me, have, you know, having read them for so many years. And then, of course, to get in there alongside Stephen King is just uh ridiculous so yeah they're they're the big boy in the block so anybody getting in yeah. there that's uh that's a great accomplishment congratulations thanks. thanks yeah before we wrap up here i got a couple more questions first yeah, sure. what in the hell is the giant werewolf thing <laughs> on the desk behind you? you know i can see my okay i can see my face in the window here down right hand corner yeah and i'm thinking i'm like oh cool you can see the mask <laughs> um here i'll show you uh when i went to transylvania the owner of the bed and breakfast, this is so cool. Um, I kept seeing this mask every day. It was down by where we had breakfast. And it was such a cool little, you know, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? It's insane. Yeah. I'll try and get you to see the whole thing. You see like the ears and it goes up. It goes all the way up. So it's like this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, was, this was sitting there. Um, and every day I would look at it and go, damn, that is a cool mask. Because we were, you know, going around Romania and going and buying souvenirs and, you know, my, my cheesy little, you know, vampire, which was so hideous. I mean, he's got all these spiky teeth. It's not even right. <laughs> um, so many things were cheesy, but this I love. It was, it was carved by the 75-year-old artist who lived in the village who no longer carves these. And I just thought it was so cool because this is weird. He's got the ears, but he's got, like, the fangs. Mm -hmm. It's, like, it's so it's different. And I, I, every, I, like, I asked the guy, I said I wanted to buy it from him. And he wouldn't sell to me. And I was like kind of heartbroken. Um, but I said, well, I understand. You know, and then when we left, the guy gave it to me. He wow. said, you know, Richard, because you've been here and you've been so nice and you know, this is your class and you know, I give this to you. And you, you have to come back someday. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, again, 
in tears practically. Um, the weird, the hardest part was getting it home. <laughs> That's pretty gigantic. I, I mean, I had to I, that I had a big suitcase and it it like barely fit in there. Went through customs. They didn't even open it. I, like I don't know how it got through. It's like I basically brought like you know. Um, like a grenade launcher in the United States. I'm like, I'm like, it's, how could you not like flag that? <laughs> I wonder if they like, opened it up and were like, no, Romania, keep going. How do I want, how do I want yeah, that voodoo? Yeah, Romania. Take, we get all kinds of weird with you. coming out of there. <laughs> yeah. So that was such, so much fun. I'd never been out of the country before. So going to teach in uh, Romania, this great little uh, hotel where they like, they had a peacock out front and they cured their own meat and made their own cheese and, you know, up and down the valley. We're like two hours east of like Bucharest. So we're out in the middle of nowhere in Bran, Romania. These like 75 year old men on the, on the, on the side of the hill with these like old scythes, like cutting the grass by hand, uh-huh. rolling it down the hill. And the hills are like, like this. Like I couldn't even, one night, uh, one of the riders there, Holly, and I wanted to climb it to get to this tree. And it was so steep, I couldn't even walk. I had to like climb hand over on my big crawl up the hill it was crazy and we saw a lot of weird things too so that night climbing the hill we got up there and then we had to kind of scoot down on our butts kind of like crab style because by then it was dark and we're like oh my god we're gonna break a leg we can't walk down it's too steep and then we get in back to the bonfire and they're like oh did you see the things on the hill with you we're like what they're like yeah there was these things with like red eyes <laughs> on the hill and we're like what what are you talking about somewhere between us and the tree in the like the farm the hotel something was on the hill with us now we said it was sheep but i don't know i don't know what it was Ho- I holly it was sheep <laughs> yeah I don't know. are they nocturnal i don't know um holly took a picture of one of the, uh we're at the bram stoker's castle and, of one of the doors a very sweet innocent door like this heart on it innocuous nothing and later when she's going through her camera looking at it um for some reason she took two quick pictures of that heart and when you go from one frame to the next it changed and she didn't do anything i mean she, i mean she took it like click click i mean what could change in, in like a second and in the second one you could see like this face you kind of like these eyes and kind of like this face it's really weird but. that is weird do you have we that picture something. anywhere uh, she, she has it somewhere. I don't. It, it's you have to really look at it. Uh, she posted it online and stuff. But uh, if you go, and it's hard. If you just see it by itself, it's hard to see. But if you go back and forth from one to the next, it definitely changes. And you can see these shadows. There's some things here and there. You know that show up weird in pictures. You get wisps of things. You don't know what it is. But I don't know. I guess it depends on what you believe in and what you don't. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> the first night we were there, they had these priests who were had this long, like half an hour <laughs> blessing and service. I mean, with holy water and, and like the, the grass and like burning sage and all this stuff and rosary. Um, it was very interesting because when they went around and had us all like kiss the rosary and kiss the cross, nobody passed. <laughs> uh. Like we had a wide, we had a wide range of people, different religious beliefs, but everyone was like, okay, sure. I'll, I'll take a little extra luck <laughs> just, just in case, you know? <laughs> um, it was so funny because I don't, you couldn't understand a word they were saying. And I didn't know if they were like blessing us or blessing the hotel or like offering us up <laughs> to some dark god or something. <laughs> Cause it just was, it had this like exorcist feeling to it. It was very creepy. But, uh, I mean, there were the locks and everything. I have an aunt who's from Romania. Oh yeah. And, uh, yeah, she's got some crazy ass beliefs. Um, but uh, when my uncle met her over there, he'd said he basically described where she lived as the villagers outside of Frankenstein's yeah. castle. Yeah, like it was crazy to him. And uh, yeah, yeah she's she's an interesting character. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was a, it was a beautiful country. We had great food. The people were all very nice. Um, but you definitely, I mean, we had Wi-Fi in the hotel, and then you'd have like a little old lady walking down the street with like a a bale on one arm and like some. <laughs> Goat milk under the other. I mean, there's some, you know, with a little babushka and all this. Yeah, it it's a very different kind of yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. It was cool. De- you definitely felt like something could happen. Um, at night, I don't, I don't know what was worse. When, when 
the dogs would bark up and down the, the valley, and you could hear them barking, and the barking would move up and down the alley like they're tracking something. I don't know what was worse, when they were barking, keeping you awake, or when they finally stopped. Oh, <laughs> when they went yeah. quiet, you're like, okay, wow, they're totally quiet. Yeah. Why are they quiet? What's going on? Did, did, <laughs> they, did they finally get them? Or are they, <laughs> did they finally shut up because it was close, and you're like, oh, okay, not, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I right, shut up. <laughs> I don't know, but it was, it, was, it was cool. It was very cool. I had a great time. And how long ago was this? I want to say it was last summer, but I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I keep talking about when I went to the Grand Canyon with my family, uh, which, which was two years ago, but it seems like, I, like, I don't know, it could be four years. I have a really bad sense of time. So my family and I drove from Chicago to L.A. for uh, the release of the new Black anthology, and we went to the Grand Canyon and up through Yosemite, and it was gorgeous. Very cool. But yeah, okay, so maybe fun. within the last year, but we're not entirely maybe, sure. Yeah, I think it was last summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it has to, it has to be because I, I taught at Iowa last summer for the first time, and I'm going back here this summer, so it has to be last year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the final thing I wanted to ask you about is when I was looking over your website, I saw you had a Kickstarter that's in progress right now. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell is Gamut Magazine? Uh, this pretty cool. I've been wanting to do this for a long time um, to start uh, an online magazine and gamut, which just means a, a wide range, but I guess specifically with me, a wide range of dark fiction. Um, there's so much going on in horror these days and in dark fiction that really all this genre bending hybrid fiction that um, it isn't just straight horror uh, or straight anything. There's a lot of stuff bending. Um, I'm a big fan of the book uh, Perdido Street Station by China Myville. Have you read it? No. Oh, you got to pick it up, pick it up. It's so good because it has elements of fantasy, elements of science fiction, and elements of horror. It's, it's the perfect positioning between all those things. It kind of kicked off the whole new weird movement. So all, uh, we're getting a lot of stuff, you know, whether it's surreal or magical realism, but stuff that's not always grounded in reality. What was the name of it again? Uh, Perdido Street Station. Per, oh, yep, I got it. Yeah, it's, street station. It's, it's brilliant. It's probably one of my favorite, I guess, science fi science fiction books. Um, but it's not too much hard science. It's like enough science that you want your. It's interesting, but it's not going to crush you. The fantasy is really cool, um, but it's not too much world building. And then, like, there's some truly horrific moments, especially later on, with these um these slake moths who have these long tongues, and there's a thing called the weaver. Is like a kind of a spider-like creature, the weaver, and he collects scissors. I don't know. It's just it's brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Um, but I think what got me excited about doing Gamut was that <clears throat> having you know been writing for a while now and reading so much and seeing all this stuff going on, the the intersection between genre and literary fiction, the intersection between fantasy, science fiction, and horror, um, the elements of kind of crime and noir and thrillers kind of bleeding into that. It's just so much really cool stuff going on. Uh, I remember going to an AWP conference and listening to Stephen Graham Jones and Brian Evanson talk and just really being blown away by how they stood up for genre, how they said you can write what you want, you can write about werewolves, you can write about vampires. Um, all this kind of movement towards this really interesting dark fiction that's not classic in the sense of, uh, of any of the genres as we know it. You know, that we're, there's so much innovation going on. Um, Jeff Vandermeer's book Annihilation being such a cool book and so different the end of it just really kind of blowing my mind um, a guy named Josh Mallerman writing a book called Bird Box have you read Bird Box? I have not I got it put that on the list it is my favorite book of 2014 it is the right year um, you're killing my TBR list uh, I'm telling you it's worth it uh, it was up for a Stoker Award it's, I read it the day after Thanksgiving and I literally could not put it down sat there in my living room down in St. Louis with my family by the fire and I was sweating. <laughs> like it was so good. So tense. Uh, brilliant. And it, just really good stuff. There's so much cool stuff going on and I'm surrounded by so many people. It's pro probably why I first started uh, reviewing books at the nervous breakdown a number of years ago. I don't do it anymore because I don't have any time, but for three years I reviewed for them. There was just so much cool stuff going on. Literary fiction is bleeding into genre all this hybrid stuff that I just wanted to get the word out about it. And so that's why I'm doing this Kickstarter. We already have like 40 authors committed to doing it. We have a bunch of uh, illustrators and photographers and designers. Um, we're trying to launch this online magazine that's going to publish the kind of 
neo-noir speculative fiction we've been talking about here today. Um, and we're going to pay 10 cents a word for original fiction. Holy which, shit. Yeah, which is, uh, which is why our goal is so high. Uh, we're, we've, we're almost at 20,000. We're about 18,000 last time I checked. But our goal is like 52,000, which is a lot. Um, but we're doing good so far. We just have to maintain um, because we want to pay our authors. And we want to publish a new story every week. And we're going to publish reprint fiction. And we're going to do poetry. And we're going to do columns. And we're paying everybody the rates they deserve to be paid. Um, so but that takes a lot of money. Magazine. So is it like a, a PDF you're going to send to people? Or is it going to no. be a website where the it's fiction gonna be, goes? It's just going to be a website uh, where we have content. And you have to log in and have a password to get to the content. And then depending on how much money we raise, um, we'll either have new stuff every day or we'll have new stuff every week. Um, new fiction, reprints, columns, poetry, maybe flash fiction. I want to, one of our first stretch goals is a scholarship for writers. And then the next stretch goal is this memoir uh, by this woman in my MFA program, uh, Jacqueline Dre Marceau. Jackie wrote this brilliant book. It's called Stripped, a memoir. She used to be a, a stripper, a dancer. And um, it's just really kind of brilliant stuff, heartbreaking, really touching about how you balance, you know, doing what you got to do to make a living and then how she, you know, kind of enjoys what she's doing. And then it's just really a great, a great book. So we have all these stretch goals and stuff, but um, yeah, so it's, it's going on right now and it's, it's doing good, but we, ne we definitely need a lot of people to sign up because the main, the main reward we have is 30 bucks to subscribe and that gets you an annual subscription. Um, so that's like $2 and 50 cents a month. That's pretty cheap um, for, for over 400,000 words is what we have budgeted for the year. Um, and then the cool thing is that if you join now, which for people who don't know is like five novels. Yeah. 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 Five long novels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what's cool is if you, if you join now for 30 bucks a year, you can renew every year at that same rate indefinitely forever. Um, it'll never go up. I'm never going to offer this rate again. The regular rate is going to be 60 bucks a year, which is $5 a month, which is still a great price. But if you join now, you get in and you lock it in indefinitely. But trying to raise $52,000, 30 bucks a, at a time <laughs> is tough. We need like 1,700 people to sign up. Um, we have some bigger rewards too. We have some editing packages that are like $1,000. Then we have some really cool um, like packages of books written backwards, donated a bunch of books. Um, we have some other smaller editing packages. And we have some really cool like postcards we designed. Uh, all these great uh, artists did, and so it means anything from a dollar to ten dollars to thirty to seventy bucks to a hundred to one hundred fifty to a thousand. So we were almost sold out of the thousand dollar one. So um, that's been kind of pushing us forward. But I mean, it, the, what we really need right now is just people to spread the word, and if it looks cool, you know, sign up. And that is, if you go to Kickstarter, it's Gamut G A M U T Magazine. Yeah, it's a really yeah. cool idea, man. I thanks, think. thanks. Yeah, we were a, we were a staff pick by them. They really like uh, a project. We're a project they love. And then last Saturday, we were the featured publishing project uh, on Kickstarter. So wow. Yeah, so we're it's good. It's uh, it's just I'm my network can only is only so big. <laughs> so you know, thanks to people like you and uh, a bunch of other people out there who are supporting and, and donating books, and we're giving stuff away every day. You know, I just we're giving away signed books today. Um, we're giving away lifetime memberships at different marks when we hit, when we hit, you know, 9,000, 10,000, when we hit 300 backers, every time we, we're trying to make it really fun and exciting to be a part of it. Cause what's, I mean, it's not just about me and my aesthetic and I mean, my desire to publish these great authors. It's about creating a community where we can all kind of build this together and then hang out and enjoy the kind of writing that we're, we've been talking about today, you know, to, to get more of that out there and to pay authors a rate that really is more in line with what they should be getting paid. 10 cents a word is pretty serious for uh, horror fiction particularly. Yeah. yeah. There aren't a lot of places that pay that, that well. And the, the ones that are paying that well, some of them are closing their doors. So, I mean, it's, I, I write stories, you know, so I know what it's like, you know, five cents a word, 4,000 word story, 200 bucks. No, 400 bucks is better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it helps, you know, I mean, I mean, if you're going to publish four stories a year, obviously it's not going to pay your mortgage, but, um, no, I was just talking to, to Damien Angelica Walters, and she published, would you say, 15, 20 stories last year. And, and if you publish 20 stories, you know, four or 5,000 words at 10 cents a word, you know, that, that starts to add up. You really can kind of, you know, make a living at it. It might not be the only thing you do, but 
you know, it helps. And I mean, heck, I'll, t- I'll take a, you know, a $400 check once a month. That's, that's good stuff. I'll take it. Yeah. That's not an insignificant amount of it money. Helps. It really does. Absolutely not. All right, Richard, I think we're, uh, I think we're out of time here, man. <laughs> I think we are. <laughs> uh, you have blown me away with all the projects you have going on. It's, thanks, uh, thanks. I hope I hope you were able to get all your questions in. <laughs> it's impressive. Well, you know, you're a, a fountain of knowledge about all these thanks. stories and books. Thanks, so I'll have to have you on again just so we can sure. talk about shit we like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to do it. I'd love to do You've it. Clearly read a hell of a lot more than I have, and I thought I read a lot. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do this again just to talk about uh, shit we we dig. So definitely, definitely. Uh, anything else you got coming up here? You want to throw out quick? Oh, man, I think we've I think we've touched on a lot. A lot. That's, uh, I think you mentioned everything you've ever done. <laughs> everything I've ever done. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Where can know, people get a hold of you? Social media, um, uh, newsletter. Yeah, yeah. Website. Yeah, I, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, my website, what does not kill me.com. You can find everything through that. Um, Gamut magazine. We're on Facebook and Twitter, dark house press run Facebook and Twitter. You can find us. Um, we're everywhere. The Kickstarter, like I said, is kind of the, the thing that's kind of kicking up my life right now. The thing I'm most passionate about. Um, we've got a really great staff and every day, you know, we're, we're bringing in, you know, 20, 30, 40 people into the fold and it's kind of building this tidal wave, this movement, and, but we still need help. So. Well, that sounds killer, man. I hope, uh, <laughs> it gets funded for you. That sounds Thank great. You. I appreciate it. Uh, before I let you go, are you looking to make that just content people can consume? Or are you trying to make a community out of it? Or like a forums um, or th- comments? Yeah, or? that's a good question. Um, I think in the beginning, and this is, you know, I'll work it out with my, with my website designer when we, you know, if we get this funded, uh, how simple or how complex we want to make it. I, I would love to see it expand to, you know, include more than just um, fiction, you know, just coming there to, kind of a one-sided conversation, you know, we, we speak and you listen, you know, I want it to be more interactive. I think as of right now, we'll definitely set it up so you can comment and interact that way. Um, <clears throat> but building in a forum and all that stuff is, is a much bigger project. So I hope we do that down the road, but we may not do that to begin with. Depend again on how much money we raise. I've been talking to the Music Box Theater here in Chicago about doing some events and they're really excited to team up with us if we can make this happen. Um, you know, cause I'm a big lover of, of movies too. So, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I have, I've never seen the, I've never seen Blade Runner on the big screen. So we're talking about doing a screen of that. And then I'm, I'm a big fan of what, um, a 24 films is doing. They did, uh, under the skin and enemy and ex machina. They have the movie, the witch coming out soon. Um, and then there's another, another studio that did uh, spring, Another movie I liked a lot. So we're trying uh, to. I liked you know, pretty much everything you just mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Damn good. So I, you know, I want it to be more than just, you know, fiction because I know people are, are complicated, interesting people, inspired by a lot of different things. I know I am. So, you know, hopefully we can make that happen too. Outstanding, man. Everybody go oh. to Kickstarter and throw a couple bucks this way. This is a Thanks. cool project. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. All right, buddy. We'll have you on again soon. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks.